Hi, my name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. Welcome to all of you to our evening services for Sunday, December the 3rd. Per usual, we will sing a few songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message that I hope will uh, lift you up just a little bit. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, uh, Songs of Faith and Praise. Uh, maybe you have that book. It'd be great. I will give you the name and the number. And if you don't, I'll make sure I will reiterate the name so that if you want to sing along with us, you have another book or you have Senor Google, uh, you can get uh, the song and sing with us. And so the first song that we will sing this evening is We Will Glorify. It is number 578. We will glorify. <clears throat> we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before his throne. We will worship him in righteousness, we will worship him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth, he is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe, all praise to him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings, hallelujah to the Lamb, hallelujah to the Lord of lords, who is the great I Am. If you return to number 770, one of my favorite songs, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind. Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, number 770. If you wonder why the words are uh, so special, they are by the poet John Greenleaf Whittier. <clears throat> Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind, in purer life, thy service find. In deeper reverence praise, in simple trust like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea. The gracious calling of the Lord, let us like them without a word rise up and follow thee. Sabbath rest by Galilee, O come of hills above, where Jesus knelt to share with thee the silence of eternity interpreted by love. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease. Take 
Take from our souls the strain and stress, and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Before we observe the Lord's Supper, uh, let's sing number 364, 364, Come Share the Lord. Come Share the Lord, 364. <clears throat> we gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. For through the loving Son, the Father makes us one. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. No one is a stranger here. Everyone belongs, finding our forgiveness here. We in turn forgive all wrongs. He joins us here. He breaks the bread. The Lord who pours the cup is risen from the dead. The one we love the most is now our gracious host. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. We are now a family of which the Lord is fed. Though unseen he meets us here in the breaking of the bread. We'll gather soon where angels sing We'll see the glory of the Lord, our coming King. Now we anticipate the feast for which we wait. Come take the bread, come drink the wine, come share the Lord. On the first day of the week, as Christians, uh, we come together and worship the Lord. This is scriptural. This is shown in our New Testament that we do gather together on the first day of the week. It is not the Sabbath day. It is not the Saturday of Judaism, but it is Sunday. Uh, it is recognized as the day that Jesus rose from the dead and fitting that this is the day that we gather together. And with that, there are certain things that we do within our fellowship in our worship service. Perhaps the crowning touch of all of this is observing the Lord's Supper. We come and we share the Lord. Uh, the song uh, lets us know that we uh, take the bread and we drink the wine. We share the Lord. Isn't this a wonderful concept? Isn't this a, a wonderful way to look at things? Uh, within the Lord's body, there are no strangers. We are all on the same walk, trying to achieve the same goal. And that goal uh, is possible because Jesus gave up his life for each of us and died on the cross. He uh, uh, had his body racked with pain as the nails were driven into his hands and feet. His side was pierced. Blood flowed from his body. And so as we partake of these emblems this evening, help us to remember our crucified Savior. Let's pray for the bread, the body of our Lord. 
We're so grateful, dear God, in your infinite plans that you sent Jesus to us at just the right time. We're so grateful that he was the master teacher, that he was able to uh, live a physical life as we did, yet not yield to temptation. And finally, he was willing to sacrifice himself one time for all. And that sacrifice for us is that uh, through it, we have the opportunity to live eternally with you. As we partake of this bread, help us to remember his body uh, that was uh, crucified on the cross. Bless us as we partake. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. Come take the bread and share the wine. Let's pray for the fruit of the vine, the blood of our Savior. We're so grateful, dear Heavenly Father, that Jesus was willing to allow the life-giving blood to flow from his body. There are so many implications to that blood. Uh, the blood is what gives us life. And indeed, the blood of Jesus does give us life. It gives us the opportunity, just as him is giving up his body, to live eternally with you. It is the blood that washes away our sins. Help us to be forgiving people as you forgive us in Jesus Christ. Be with us as we partake of this fruit of the vine. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. And having completed the Lord's Supper, we are also instructed on the first day of the week to lay by and store that which we have prospered. We live in a prosperous nation, and I know that each of us uh, understands that. And, you know, we all come from uh, different socioeconomic backgrounds, and we live in our own socioeconomic world, but we also uh, have blessings that are just unimaginable. And so as we think of those blessings, help us to give back monetarily uh, to our church. Uh, our church, which uh, is here to bring others to Christ, that is here to help those that are in need. And so we pray that you would bless us as we give. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, help us to be grateful and cheerful givers. Help us to realize as we give back to you that we just give back to you uh, what you have blessed us with. Help us to understand that uh, we come into this world with nothing uh, physically and we will leave it with nothing. Bless us as we give and help uh, those that use these funds to use it in a way that your name will be glorified and others will come to the Lord. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Last song that we will sing is number 238. 238, you are the song that I sing. <clears throat> You are the song that I sing. <clears throat> you are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. That was so much. Let's sing it again. That was so much fun. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. 
You are the melody, you are the harmony, praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the songs that you gave to me, you are the song that I sing. Oh, I'm so glad that we all got to sing together. I know that the Lord was glorified. I know that I was lifted up by singing praises to our God. And so with that, uh, we will get to the lesson part of our evening service. Again, if you were there this morning and maybe you were um, heard the title of this lesson and wonder where I am going with it and... Uh, the lesson comes from Matthew chapter 7 and verse 18. And the title of this lesson this evening is How to Recognize Spiritual Weeds in Your Life. Yes, I said that. That's the way I said it. Weeds. Uh, how to Recognize Spiritual Weeds in Our Life. Now, I'm the first person to tell you I am not the farming type. Uh, we have folks in our church that are very good at that. Uh, I know that in the springtime and the early summer, we're blessed with uh, the harvest of some of our members and they bring it into our church building and lay it on the table in our fellowship room and we're free to uh, take of that. And I will be the first to uh, let you know that uh, I am not the gardening type. To put it really in perspective, Jane went away for a week and asked me, of course, uh, I'm in charge of watering all the plants. I can water. Uh, uh, I can do that. I, I'm good at that. And there was this flower out on the deck, and it was so pretty, and I watered it every day for a week. And it wasn't until the end of the week that I realized it was a plastic plant. Uh, I'm just telling all myself it's kind of the way it is. And so... Imagine if you would, and, and for me, I, I, as I said, I, I, I haven't done much gardening. Um, imagine if you would planting something and, in anticipating that it will grow. And, you know, we know, interestingly enough, and I, I brought this forth in a lesson not too long ago, when we put the seed in the ground, no matter how we orient the seed, the, the stem comes out of the ground and always makes its way up toward the sunlight. It is one of those miracles of, of God that he sees fit to, that that will take place. And you know what? Um, I'm reminded of a story I, I read and, and I think if my memory serves me and, uh, those of you that know me remember, I remember trivial things. Uh, uh, it's a kind of a blessing and a curse that have happened to me many, many years ago. But we had a reading book in our school in the first three or four grades. And in that reading book, it told the story of, of someone who planted some plants and, uh, kept waiting for uh, the plants to grow. And he meticulously uh, picked the weeds out and he was left with these semi-vibrant plants. And then he looked at them and, and he noticed as they grew, they weren't bearing the fruit that he thought they would grow. And a neighbor came along who happened to be a gardener and he said, boy, you have a, a wonderful crop of burdock here. And I says, I said to him, you know, the, the, the story goes that the man said, I didn't, I didn't plant any burdock. He said, well, burdock is a weed. You can look it up, by the way. Uh, burdock does have some interesting uses to it, but it, it kind of grows wild. And so with that, the, the person learned that when you plant, you need to be able to recognize. Now, in today's world with YouTube, uh, there, there is literally no reason for us to plant plants and not recognize the plant that we're looking for. 
I remember the, <laughs> this horrible story about a man who was such a novice farmer. He planted potatoes and he kept waiting for the potatoes to come up. And uh, again, the neighbor came up and, and he said to his neighbor, he said, man, I planted these potatoes and look, all this growth, but no potatoes. And of course, the man just reached down into the ground and dug. And of course, the potatoes were under the ground. Uh, this is pretty bad, isn't it? <laughs> this is pretty novice. Um, when we grow a garden, we painstakingly water and we painstakingly weed. We do that so that the plants that we plant will get all of the nourishment and the weeds around them will not and uh, I, I sometimes think, you know, uh, there are certain plants, and, and being a science teacher, I know this, that are perennials, and there are certain ones that are annuals. For example, if you grow strawberries, uh, they will come back the following year. They are perennial plants. Uh, but uh, many of the plants, like you know, carrots and beets and, you know, uh, peas and so forth, uh, you must plant every year. And so we, we have expectations that the strawberries will come back, but uh, we know that uh, certain plants, those annuals, we have to, uh, we have to take care of business. We have to make sure that uh, we are properly watering and fertilizing and seeing that the plants that are coming up are those that we desire. They are the plants that will bear fruit. And so as we look at, at what has been planted, we hope that it will grow. And we hope that as we water it and we fertilize it, the stem and the leaves will grow the way they uh, are supposed to grow. And so I, I pause to think as you weed a garden, lots of things start rolling around in my mind. As Christians, how many of us have weeds that have taken root in our lives. Weeds that have taken root in our lives. Uh, Matthew chapter 7 verse 18 says that a good tree cannot bear fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Words of wisdom to live by. And Jesus in his parables uh, very often used the farming analogies because they lived in an agrarian farming society. And so we, you know, we have the parable of the different types of soil that seed fell among. But I'm especially interested in a parable that Jesus told in Matthew uh, chapter 13, uh, verses 34 uh, to 30, uh, 24 to 30. And it is simply titled, The Tares and the Wheat. Now, for those of us, again, that are, you know, are, are new to all this, we've read this parable over and over again. And we've come to understand that tares are weeds. Now, the interesting thing was that a farmer planted wheat and uh, while it was growing, an enemy of his planted these tares, these weed-like uh, kind of useless uh, plants alongside of it. And when the man's servants saw that, uh, they were wondering what they should do. Should we pull up the weeds so that the wheat can grow? And the wise farmer said, well, probably not a good idea because they've grown to an extent that if you pull those out, there's a good chance that you will damage the main crop. And so he let them grow to maturity. And then the separation took place. 
And so with that in mind, uh, I want to stop talking about farming since I don't know a lot about it and raising crops and hopefully talk about some spiritual things, which uh, my mind is much more geared to. How many things have we poured hours of our time into? Uh, our time and our attention. And those things sometimes are choking out the spiritual fruit that we're trying to grow. Now, with that, as Christians, from a spiritual standpoint, we need to understand the difference between the seed and the fruit. Because sometimes it's easy to mistake one for the other. And so we have a passage in the fifth chapter of Galatians that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. And it is, the, the verse starts by saying, the fruit of the Spirit is. And so now we're going to get to spiritual food. And he enumerates, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These are the fruit of the Spirit, the wonderful fruit of the Spirit. They are virtues in our life that we hope will grow as plants might grow. Now, as we complete the verses, it says, Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so it says, if we live by the Spirit, let us walk in step with the Spirit. Do you know what it means to have a gold standard? There was once a time when all of our money in the United States was backed by gold. And so a dollar bill was backed in our treasury by a dollar's worth of gold. We went off the gold standard many, many, many years ago in our country. But these verses about the fruit of the Spirit set the gold standard for us. What are we investing our time and our energy in? Is it to growing these virtues? Is it for us to be growing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control? Are we striving for this to be the fruit in our lives. Hmm. And so if we are investing our time, we're good farmers. We're good spiritual farmers. See, here's the kicker. When we find out that we are investing much of our time and energy into things that aren't of a spiritual nature. Sometimes we consider that to be a weed. And if it's a weed, we have to be willing to reach down and pluck that weed out of the dirt and uproot it. Why? Because if it grows, it will choke out 
the fruit that we are working so hard to grow. I know Jane and I, uh, uh, Jane's father was a farmer and uh, one of the crops he grew was this perennial crop called alfalfa. Alfalfa is ensilage, it's food for animals. And you come through it, you mow it, and then you bale it, and you sell it, and buy the bale. Well, it was always interesting. We, there's this one alfalfa field we go to when we uh, go out together. Uh, we spend one day of the week going out looking for bald eagles in a section of New Jersey. And, you know, of course, uh, we're going through farmland, and this man has this stand of alfalfa. Uh, in the background in a tree, there's a big eagle nest. That's why this is kind of interesting to me. And when we look at it, uh, we say, well, that's a pretty good stand of alfalfa. Well, what's that mean? Well, it means most of the field is alfalfa and there's not much weed mixed in with it because it's the alfalfa that is the crop that the farmer wants to bale so that he can sell it for food for animals. Now, with that in mind, uh, can we see examples that are going on in our life that are keeping us from meeting the gold standard? Uh, I'm guilty, and I'm sure all of us have some guilt, don't we? that we see it in our lives. And sometimes we don't work very hard to curtail it. Uh, some of us have Netflix that we can get movies whenever we want to. Uh, some of us spend time on social media and we are engaged with that. And it's easy to spend way too much time with that. Some of us like the news and we turn into our favorite news stations because there is a 24 hour news cycle. And I have a couple little pet things. I like to watch episodes of MASH that I've seen dozens and dozens of times and I still get a, a charge out of it and I spend time looking at something that I already know <laughs> the outcome. That time and that energy. And if this puts us on a guilt trip, so be it. Can keep us from attaining the gold standard of spiritual fruit. This time and energy would be better spent doing the work of the Lord in our lives, the, the work that the Lord has given us to do, or loving and serving people he has placed in our life. As we complete this lesson, here's the bottom line, I believe. Whatever you water will grow. If you water the weeds, the weeds will grow and they will choke out the good things. The weeds that we care for, maybe even mistakenly, will choke out the fruit that we want to grow in our life. And if we spend too much time in that, we won't attain the love and the joy and the peace and the patience and the kindness and the goodness and the faithfulness and the gentleness and the self-control that we strive for. If I let weeds grow in my garden of life and I don't effectively deal with them, they will choke out what is good. Jesus said, many say, Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say. We can't give lip service to the Lord when it comes to be the spiritual beings that we ought to be. 
And so with that, what we need to do in our lives is to weed and to water, to get rid of those things that will keep us from doing the Lord's work and will keep us from attaining that wonderful, wonderful, uh, those fruit that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote, writes about in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22. That should be our goal, to get rid of the weeds and grow the fruit. Why? Because Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. It is our deeds, the deeds that we do for good through our faith that characterizes us as being the Christians we should be. So if you're here this evening and you haven't become a child of God and haven't begun your walk, we pray that you will start that walk so that you can get those weeds out of your life. That's what repentance is. Repentance is putting the things behind you that shouldn't be there. If you haven't heard the word and believed it and confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, repented of your former ways, and been baptized for the mission of your sins, you're not one of God's children, and your fruit will be lacking. And so if you need to respond to the invitation this evening, it is open to you. If you need to come to the Lord, please do so. Let's end this with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the lives that you've given us. And we're grateful that we are spiritual beings, having been created in your image, in your spiritual image. Bless us as we try to grow in spirit. Because we know that Jesus talked about himself. And he talked about us uh, learning about him and knowing that God is spirit and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Bless us on our walk. Help us to weed out those things that would keep us from being the type of Christians that you would have us to be and living the godly lives that we should be leading. We pray that you would forgive us of our sins. Be with us and comfort us this evening. Help us to know that you're always available to us through prayer, and we can let our needs uh, be known to you. Help us that we might uh, get into that relationship with you so that the peace that passes all understanding will guide our lives. Be with us this evening. Help us to look forward to the next time that we meet together. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe. And may God bless you all.